So in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, Merton wrote that the rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form, of its innate violence. While speaking thus to the activist or idealist tendency toward frenzy or even burnout, Merton synthesizes one of the most pervasive phenomena of our time, afflicting virtually all of the semi-privileged of late capitalism is a collective unconsciousness, strategically generated and maintained by overwork, media saturation, the bodily extension that is the smartphone, 24 seven news and advertisements and notifications, alienation from sisters and mother earth. It infiltrates, corrupts and stays. It erects artificial separations between beings and within the body itself. It is in our time, a source of violence itself. Thus, while, Merton, while Merton's famous awakening at Fourth and Walnut has him exclaiming, there are no strangers, I argue that the rush, pressure, and noise of life in late capitalism enact an inward sense of strangerness, the same strangerness that Merton realized and resisted in his own contemplative life, and a strangerness that for us has arguably deepened in the decades since he lived. In the article, Seeds of Deconstruction, Insights from Merton for, for a Postmodern World, Dan Haran begins by arguing at some length about the relevance of Merton in today's world. He says, to claim that a 20th century monk who died in 1968 has something to offer a world that bears an uncanny dissimilarity to the one which he inhabited nearly a half century earlier is indeed bold, if not ostensibly foolish. Yet I remain convinced that there are ways in which Thomas Merton's work offers insightful direction for spirituality in a postmodern world. I seek to challenge the fact of Haran's argument, not least because the insights of the wise among us human beings, including and especially Merton, if their insights are truly worth heeding, seldom fall out of meaning. What is more, Merton demonstrably detected the violences of modern life even from his somewhat cloistered station. While the rush and pressure of the world have taken on a digital face since Merton inhabited it, I argue that this world is not dissimilar from Merton's. Rather, this late capitalist world is an uncanny deepening of the strangeness that Merton experienced, both inwardly and outwardly. We may encounter manifold more layers of noise and distraction in our journeys toward the strange center of our being than Merton did. However, Merton's prophetic model of contemplative encounter of the inward stranger is without question a blueprint for our own encountering of strangerness and late capitalism. In this reflection, I first dive into the singularity of late capitalism and how the tendrils of this time and place being the 21st century within privileged American consumer society reach into our being and exacerbate strangerness. Then I specify Merton's contemplative model of encountering inner strangerness in his time and explore how it might be brought into ours, contextualizing these practices of countering in the face of exacerbated noise, heightened speeds, and the pervasive digital. In Cold War Letters, Merton wrote, we live in a prophetic and eschological times, and by and large, everyone is asleep. We realize it dimly, like sleepers who have turned off the alarm clock without quite waking up. Before delving into the Mertonian model of countering strangerness, it is critical to understand the context under which this model deepens in urgency. While Merton's time was fraught with social and political upheaval, he entered the Abbey of Gethsemane three days after Pearl Harbor and died a month after President Nixon was elected. The world's violences have only become exacerbated today and with the perils of the age of separation on top of it. That is, despite phenomena such as globalization and the pervasiveness of the internet, human beings are left more separated from one another within and across cultures than ever before. Even more, in spite of virtuous efforts to increase ecological consciousness over the last half century, Human society is in the midst of the most exploitative relationship with the earth it ever has been, which more likely than not will lead to our own collapse 
What may be human humanity's greatest crime is its separation from itself, the conscious or unconscious drowning of silence with noise and stimulus, the scarcity of solitude, and the false or forced constructions of self. This holds a heavy weight. Merton affirmed that to hold human relations together by love is necessarily to cultivate love through interior solitude. For divine love, or interior love for that matter, is the basis of love for others and thus for loving acts in the world. The phenomenon of strangerness, of collective unconsciousness regarding humanity's own state of being, also lends itself to a fundamental erosion of imagination. It is hard to imagine what it feels like without a phone attached to one's body, without perpetual buzzing of news or social media, of texts or emails, without the transactions of the marketplace seeping into our interactions with one another. It is hard to visualize a world that's radically different from this one. This is called capitalist realism, the widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible even to imagine a coherent alternative to it. One of the most characteristic manifestations of capitalist realism embodied is that of pervasive mental distress. Under capitalist realism, mental disorders are seen to be as natural as the weather. Critical theorists contemporary with Merton organized around the politicization of extreme mental disorders, such as schizophrenia in the case of Deleuze and Guattari. But the necessity now is to reframe the more commonplace kinds of mental illness, such as anxiety and depression, in terms of their politics. Rather than placing the burden of resolving psychological distress on individuals themselves, that is, with, rather than accepting the vast privatization of stress as fact, it must be asked, why is it accepted that so many human beings, especially the young, experience distress with frequency? The ubiquity of mental distress under capitalism suggests that instead of being a favorable system of social organization, capitalism itself is what is dysfunctional, and thus the veneer of its apparent utility for human beings holds high costs for the human person. What exacerbates the incidence of mental distress and complicates one's capacity to transcend it is something which Duane Elgin termed involuntary complexity. One of the parents of the movement toward voluntary simplicity, Elgin asserted that this involuntary complexity constitutes the backdrop against which actors in capitalist society are to engage, marked by waste, stress, greed, clutter, pollution, risk, anxiety, overpopulation, lack of personal control, global economic inequality, social fragmentation, and other well-known roots of modern mental distress. Mental distress is furthermore the discharge of the culture industry, which self-advertises, however subliminally, as an antidote to capitalist alienation, but is nonetheless a poorly disguised car carrier of the same disease. One of the culture industry's distinguishing appeals is its supply of a space in which to give ourselves up to the time of the other, thereby losing ourselves through identificatory fantasy. Of course, the very, very necessity to give ourselves up derives from utter exhaustion and work and the only basis on which culture industry technologies seize power over society is the power of those whose economic position in society is strongest. For the sake of disguising alienation and suppressing consciousness, late capitalism thus generates, even mandates, passivity in the workplace and beyond it, wherever culture can penetrate. In addition to mental distress, the culture industry, namely in keeping human beings perpetually hooked up to the entertainment matrix, whether through handfuls of social media apps, constant music and buzzing and beeps, holding close to our bodies our devices as if they are our offspring, further discharges, quote, twitchy, agitated interpassivity, an inability to concentrate or focus. There could be no greater danger to daily contemplative groundedness than to erode away, voluntarily or not, our capacity to pay attention to the world. Speaking in Mertonian terms, to address this mental distress and twitchiness or alienation from self 
is, quote, the greatest need of our time, end quote. We are to, quote, clean out the enormous mass of mental and emotional rubbish that clutters our minds and makes all political and social life a mass illness, end quote. Thomas Merton centered much of his early writing on the existence of the illusory and strange false self, a superficial identity constructed out of ego, a clinging to cultural objects, and a conviction of one's separateness from even supremacy over other human beings. Merton writes, rationalizing and excusing the lusts and ambitions of a selfish and fleshly ego, camouflaging its own defects and magnifying the sins of others, evading its countless fears, forcing itself to believe its own lies, the psyche of man struggles in a thousand ways to silence the secret voice of anxiety. Merton here speaks to a perennial inward strangerness within the human being. However, coupled with his diagnosis of the world as increasing, increasingly eschatological and asleep, this reflection touches the heart, if it may be so called, of capitalism's mass illness. He may as well have said a prayer for us, for those of us trying to live and survive in the present. The distractions of late capitalism then perpetuate alienation between human beings, not only through providing a false and destructive escape, but also through reinforcing the individualistic false self and the disease of separateness. Merton was attentive to the modern capitalist illusions with, that seep into the human soul and groom a collective estranged self. Nevertheless, it is unambiguous that these illusions have intensified their grasp on human beings. Phenomena which since Merton's time have claimed to connect human beings, such as the globalized economy and the internet, cultivate an even deeper sense of unconsciousness and strangeness across cultures and generations and institutions. It is thus ever urgent to bring to the fore a Mertonian model for countering this strangeness, particularly within our own beings. In Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, Merton wrote, solitude has its own special work, a deepening of awareness that the world needs, a struggle against alienation. True solitude is deeply aware of the world's needs. It does not hold the world at arm's length. In one of his most beloved poems, Merton's fellow poet and Kentuckian Wendell Berry beckons, quote, so friends, every day do something that won't compute. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias, end quote. To engage in resistance is to refuse to gaze at the world through a lens of transaction, to think beyond the limits of force-fed desires and toward the interconnectedness of all beings in all times, in all places, to look inward so as to look lovingly outward. So too does Merton's contemplative model of addressing inward strangerness speak in anti-capitalist terms. This model originates in Merton's life example as much as in his vast collection of published works. His is a practice which goes by many names, contemplation, contemplative prayer, meditation, solitude, even mysticism. He insisted that this contemplation, quote, can never be the object of calculated ambition, end quote. There is no contemplative formula, no 12-step program. One cannot buy or force contemplation. To put it in Wendell Berry's terms, contemplation as a model of knowing won't compute. The neoliberal world cannot make sense of this contrarian practice which inherently adopts a non-transactional stance and a pace of slowness against the rush and the pressure of the capitalist world. Contemplation is neither a quick fix for nor a refuge from the destruction waged by human beings' ego, individual or collective. Rather, the truth is to the contrary. Merton says, the deep inexpressible certitude of the contemplative experience awakens a tragic anguish and opens many questions in the depths of the heart, like wounds that cannot stop bleeding. A necessary, never easy opening up to the world. Make no mistake, the anti-capitalist model of contemplation, which Merton advocated, bears no resemblance with the products or experiences peddled by the modern mindfulness industry, such as corporate retreats, iPhone applications, and celebrity endorsements of monks. <clears throat> 
To equate the two is to cheapen Merton's radical witness. Rather, the so-called McMindfulness, which is sold today, reduces contemplation to an easily diverted self-help technique to, in order to reproduce institutional power. Corporations such as Facebook and Google co-opt meditative practices in order to, quote, individualize stress, help workers deal with toxic business life and lack of rest, promote acceptance of the status quo, and encourage the focus of attention on business objectives, end quote. Bringing Merton's model into the context of late capitalism as an attempt to address and encounter the inner stranger must therefore mean that one is vigilant in maintaining the anti-capitalist stance that Merton himself took. Merton is not alone in detecting the mutually constitutive threads connecting the soul and society at large. Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh similarly insists that, quote, the roots of war are in the way we live our daily lives, end quote. In other words, that inward strangerness creates a strange and fear-filled world, just as late capitalism exacerbates our perennial inward strangerness. While I have thus far emphasized Merton's contemplative practice as it relates to his own being, it is significant to note that, as with Nat Han's wisdom, Merton's practice does not so clearly distinguish the work of the self and the work of the world. In fact, I argue that Merton's model of countering strangerness is grounded in his Louisville epiphany at the storied corner of Fourth and Walnut. He writes of the moment, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. The whole illusion of a separate holy existence is a dream. I imagine that Merton was, a was for a time immobilized by this new consciousness, which on its surface might challenge his monastic vocation, but ultimately deepens its inner meaning. What makes Thomas Merton's work holy is not his spurious self-isolation from the world, as if he were a special breed of person but rather his capacity to seek out silence like any human being for the sake of all human beings. Merton further scores this groove of the significance of solitude. Quote, my solitude, however, is not my own, for I see now how much it belongs to them and that I have a responsibility for it in their regard, not just my own. It is because I am one with them that I owe it to them to be alone. And when I am alone, they are not they, but my own self. There are no strangers. Solitude is a natural, necessary manifestation of the interconnectedness of humanity. It exists as a central social obligation undertaken not as a means of escaping this oneness, but rather originating in grateful recognition of one another. There are no strangers, and our true selves are not made up of strangerness, even though we might be muddied by it. Though late capitalism makes this century more silty, Merton's contemplative practice is a dive into the muddy waters just as ours can be. To ground being in action and contemplation, to hold vigilantly our interconnectedness, to walk through a transactional world in a way that won't compute, to love all these people, if, if we act in this way, we bring Thomas Merton's anti-capitalist model of contemplation into our own time for our own time. The urgency of climate crisis, especially for those among us most marginalized, calls us toward a radical path of encountering the strangeness within. The similar urgency of the techno-capitalist world, almost irrevocably lulling us into unconsciousness, into bureaucracy, into hierarchy, and into that strangerness requires of us a resistance grounded in contemplation and in attentiveness to nearby dangers. Beginning to embody a contemplative conscious answer to this urgency is simple, but it is by no means easy or safe. As Merton tells us, it is an experience of tragic anguish, of opening many questions in the depths of the heart like wounds that cannot stop bleeding. It looks a little like this. Divorcing our phones and screens from our bodies, grounding each day in contemplation, keeping the earth at the fore of our thoughts, refusing hierarchy, 
decolonizing our minds from the dichotomies of Western violence, continuously birthing into existence new ways in which to love and express it, clinging to cracks of light and forging our own. It even looks like this, cherishing the nonviolence flowing from contemplation, which necessarily involves a public vocality against all forms of violence, whether of capitalism or hierarchy, war or whiteness, colonialism or occupation. There is little solid ground on which the contemplative contrarian may stand. But it must be remembered that what's ultimately wanted within all beings is love. Uncovering this love, a love buried beneath the inward stranger, buried, as Merton tells us, under words, noise, plans, projects, systems, and apostolic gimmicks, is a lifelong endeavor whose hidden reality is worthy of our time, our slowness, our effort, and our hope. Thank you. <laughs>